Code Orange, Chapter 14. Derek, you, you think Mitty is missing because somebody took him? Olivia whispered. Kidnapped him? Because they want his virus? Derek loved how she asked him instead of the FBI or the CDC. He nodded. Then he didn't kill himself, she said, sagging with relief. He's safe. He's kidnapped, Derek corrected her, which is not very safe. But it's alive, said Olivia. We're going to ask you not to discuss this with anyone, said Finelli. Not your parents, not your teachers, not your friends, not a single classmate. It won't be easy. We'll have to think up excuses for this time we've spent. Does Dr. Larkin know? asked Derek. Does Mr. Lynch? They do not. We will instruct Dr. Larkin not to ask you anything. Now, promise you're going to keep this situation a secret. The most important thing is to not throw the New York City and New York City into a panic. We cannot use the word smallpox. The most important thing to me, said Olivia, is finding Mitty. We'll find him. Derek wasn't so sure. He wasn't all that impressed by the FBI's track record. What had it taken, like 10 or 15 years to locate the Unabomber? And even then, it wasn't the FBI who'd found him. The guy's brother had figured it out. And nobody had to solve the anthra nobody had solved the anthrax mailing. To explain this meeting, Finelli suggested, tell your friends that there was some initial confusion about Mitty's whereabouts, and Dr. Larkin thought you might have information, but in fact Mitty's parents took him out of school for early for vacation. This was almost reasonable because winter vacation was only two weeks off. St. Ray parents had little use for school calendars and pretty much took trips when they felt like it. Olivia and Derek were dismissed. They left the headmaster's office and walked through the tangle of secretary's desks and out into the main hall where they grounded to a halt like stalled cars. They had so many more questions, so much talking to do. Dr. Larkin rushed out to them. Now we'll go straight back to class, he said briskly. Of course, said Olivia. I'll meet with you, with you later, said Dr. Larkin. Oh, absolutely, said Derek. Dr. Larkin went back into his office. Olivia and Derek went out the front door. They stood on the granite steps, staring at a sky that also looked granite. I can't believe that man seriously thought you and I would sit in a classroom at a time like this, said Olivia. Let's go over to Mitty's apartment, said Derek. See what his parents know. Do you think they'll talk to us? She said doubtfully. <laughs> Mitty's best friend and his girlfriend? Of course they'll talk to us. They must be scared to death, hanging over their phone, trying to call Mitty on his cell, praying he'll call them, reading his biology paper and that horrible letter over and over. I don't think Mr. and Mrs. Blake even know I exist. Mm, probably not, agreed Derek. I mean, if I had a girlfriend, I wouldn't talk it over with my mom and dad, but they know now because they must have talked to these guys. It was only a dozen short blocks to Mitty's, making the subway more trouble than it was worth. Olivia was usually a big window shopper and loved looking in every window, from the locksmith to his, with his four-foot-wide shop, to the shoe store she couldn't afford, from the boutiques that specialized in brimless caps or glitzy evening bags, to the bakery windows, where she took one look and had to have that pastry or collapse. Now she couldn't see through her tears. Let's not take Columbus Avenue, she said to Derek. Let's walk along the river. He's not in the river, Olivia. If the NYPD or the FBI thought May'd drown himself, he'd be out there. They'd be out there. But they turned west anyway. East-west blocks were long, and today they seemed even longer. At the sight of the Hudson, Olivia burst into tears. Why didn't May trust me? Why didn't he share any of this with me? Well, he didn't trust me either, and I'm not crying, said Derek. Cut it out with the emotion. We have to think what to do next. Derek would stack his brains against anybody's, and Olivia's brains were way better than his. The two of them could get ahead of any old FBI in a New York minute. If Mitty could communicate with us, he would, said Olivia. His silence is a bad sign. Derek wasn't convinced that Mitty wanted to do any communicating. If Mitty had gone underground, he could only pull it off by not communicating. The problem with vanishing in New York was, where did you find the privacy? and the money to pay for it. Transportation was a problem. I mean, sure, there were a million trains and buses, but to where and what then? 
Stop trying to see a body in the Hudson, Olivia. We need to figure out where Mitty would hide out. Well, you think that's what happened? I would hide out. It'd be way more fun that way. Well, fun if you don't get smallpox. Mitty gets smallpox, and I guess he's pretty much permanently out of fun. Olivia sat down on a bench. There were dozens of them facing the Hudson, lined up against gnarled cherry trees. In spring, summer, and fall, Riverside Park was a joy. In February, it had nothing going for it. Derek sat down next to her. I'm not going to school tomorrow either, Olivia told him. I don't want anybody questioning me. I don't want to risk sobbing with anybody but you. I don't want to do something stupid like take a quiz. I just want to sit on this bench. And freeze to death and think about Mitty? No, we'll think of something to do. We'll accomplish something. Olivia took out her cell phone and called the school. Olivia, said Dr. Larkin excitedly, as if he had known all along that she would tell him everything. Derek and I will not be in class for the remainder of the week. Olivia, I don't know what's going on, but you leave whatever it is to the FBI. You two get back here now or I will telephone your parents. And tell them what? asked Olivia. Since we're not permitted to discuss any aspect of this, Derek and I will not fall behind in class. Kindly give us excused absences for the rest of today and for Thursday and Friday. How surprising, thought Derek, that Mitty had been drawn to this girl. Mitty was relaxed and good-humored, slow to worry and quick to have a good time. Olivia was not relaxed, not particularly good-humored, and had a rare definition of a good time, scholarship. Olivia hung up. It was fun to give Dr. Larkin orders, but basically I'm scared, Derek. The men in the office and Dr. Graham, they didn't seem scared. How come they weren't scared? Oh, I think they're just good actors. But maybe they know more than they said, or they're too excited to be scared. I was excited following anthrax history. You were excited about following typhoid. But this is the real thing. Maybe it's so exciting to be in the midst of bioterrorism that they don't have time to be scared. No, you're right. We have to think of something to do. I can't think of anything except to walk up and down every street of the five boroughs looking for a thread from Mitty's sweater, said Olivia glumly. I'll bet it's only four boroughs, said Derek. Manhattan's, rent pretty, Manhattan's pretty high rent for taking prisoners. They'd want some isolated warehouse and some wreck of a slum where Mitty could scream all he wants and no one would hear. They gazed at the water. No bodies. Nobody looking for bodies either. Derek couldn't stand it. He hauled Olivia onto 72nd Street, where they left the park, passed Eleanor Roosevelt's statue, and headed to Mitty's. It just seems so strange, said Olivia, for those guys to tell us everything and risk having us let out the news? Smallpox news? It's all about risk, thought Derek. You're always guessing. A little knowledge here, a speck of information there. You do the best you can with what you have. And what does Mitty have right now? Anything? Mrs. Blake was barely holding together. She struggled to have a normal conversation with these friends of her missing son. I wish I'd known Mitty was dating such a lovely girl, she said, trying to smile. It's a stretch to say we're dating, Olivia said honestly. I was pushing for it, but Mitty's mind was elsewhere. Mrs. Blake started weeping, which, from the look of her face, she'd been doing a lot of. His mind was on death and disease. I had no idea Mitty was keeping secrets from me. Derek was pretty sure every 16-year-old boy in the world kept secrets from his mother. But for Mitty's sake, he was nicer than he would have been to his own mother. Um, not, not secrets, Mrs. Blake. Just stuff you hadn't worked through yet. The whole letter is somebody still thinking it through. He saw that she did not agree and that she had found the letter pretty coherent. She looked away from Derek and into the eyes of the girl her son liked. Do you think Mitty killed himself? No, said Olivia calmly. Derek gave Olivia points. He told Mrs. Blake about Mitty's teen suicide essay. Mr. Blake was just standing there. Derek didn't want to look at Mitty's father. He was afraid that while Mitty's mother was still hoping, Mitty's father had assumed the worst. Mrs. Blake pressed her hands over her mouth and then took them away, and words that she did not want to speak flew out of her mouth. What do you think of the FBI's theory about, you know, some sort of people taking Mitty? She was dancing around the word terrorists. What if he's out there somewhere, 
The prisoner of somebody planning to harvest smallpox virus from his body? Harvest? repeated Derek. That's the word the CDC used. As if it's a crop. As if many is a field. And when he breaks out in pustules. Derek changed the subject. Did you guys know about these scabs? He asked Mr. Blake. No. They searched his room, but although many had four old books listed in his bibliography, there were only three under his bed. No envelope. His backpack is gone, though. Maybe he has that book and the scabs with him. Well, can we look around? asked Derek. Sure, but the FBI was thorough, said Mr. Blake, as he led them into Mitty's bedroom. Olivia stood in the door of Mitty's room, appalled. She didn't want to go in. People lived like this? People she liked lived like this? What exactly happened? Like, you called the NYPD, and then they called the FBI and the CDC? asked Eric. Well, as far as we can tell, Mitty's emails were forwarded to the FBI and the CDC. Both of them were closing in on his location at the same time we were calling the police. The CDC got here in the middle of the night, hoping to find the scabs. The FBI dusted for fingerprints, as if Mitty could have been snatched from here. Derek doubted that. What with the doormen and desk staff? It'd be hard for strangers to get into the building unnoticed. And if they did slip in, and knew the right apartment, and got up to the eighth floor, and Mitty let them in, and they overpowered him, how did they get him back down in a small elevator used by 26 floors worth of residents without somebody noticing an unconscious or fighting teenage boy? They went back to the splendid living room with its fine paintings and large furniture. Floor-to-ceiling windows looked down on a school playground and the thin, sad bows of small trees in winter. Behind these were apartment buildings, narrow and tall like a child's drawing of a cityscape. Olivia said, Does Minnie's sister know? We called Emily at college, said Mrs. Blake. Her plane is due in another hour. We can't leave the phone in case Minnie calls. My brother is picking her up. If Minnie called, he could use their cell numbers. They didn't have to stay in the same room with the regular line. But maybe if the Blakes weren't safely inside this apartment, their fear would spin out of control. And there was a lot to be scared about. Because kidnappers would want Minnie dead in the end, Derek thought, since he could identify them. So even if Mitty hadn't already died of smallpox, or drowning, or anything else, he was still going to be dead. Mitty's father must have arrived at this conclusion before Derek and was keeping silent because he knew there was no good ending. Mrs. Blake and Olivia were filled with hope and the conviction that all would be well. There's no way, thought Derek.